Today we're going to finish up what we started last week. Last week I said we were going to discuss the four stages of underwriting so that you'd have an understanding as to what, what goes on. I mean, you always hear this, well, underwriting said this, and underwriting said that, and underwriting said this, and, and uh, people get this thing that there's, these underwriters are these one-eyed cyclops that uh, make these decisions that either allow something to happen or don't allow it to happen, and I want to dismiss that because it really doesn't work quite that way. So last week we talked about stages one and two. Stage one we talked about is automated underwriting. And I used the term garbage in, garbage out. In other words, automated underwriting is just like anything that you and I would put into a computer. If I enter good information, I'm going to get back accurate information. If I put in garbage, I'm going to get garbage out. Same thing when a lender uses automated underwriting at the very beginning stage, if we don't put in accurate information, or worse yet, and many of you said last week that this happened, you've had this happen, where the borrower puts in the information, and the information's wrong, and then it comes, and nobody bothers to check it, and then they get this quote-unquote pre-approval letter that says, oh, they qualify for this, and it's not even close. So garbage in, garbage out. Lenders can have to, should, they don't all do it, but they should review the information that was input against the supporting documents. God forbid they should not get supporting documents, but guess what? They don't get supporting documents too often. So anyway, that's AUS, Automated Underwriting System. Every lender in the country uses it, from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all right? But again, garbage in, garbage out. That's used at the very front end. When, I, when we first do a pre-approval, we use that. So that's number one. Number two is what I call the initial underwrite. So the loan now, you write a binding contract, the loan now comes in, and the loan officer then takes the loan, does their thing with it, and then sends it over to uh, the operations team. When it goes to operations, there's some processing, there's some things that they have to do to the loan. They got order a title, order an appraisal, if they're ordering it right away, uh, verifications of employment, whatever it happens to be, that gets done usually pretty quick. And loan goes to somebody called a processor. Processor gets the loan put together, and it varies a little bit from lender to lender as to what they do, but many lenders today try to take, as, as long as there's enough information to make a credit decision, they move that loan into underwriting. That's stage two, the initial underwrite. At this point, an underwriter now is going to look at the loan, and here's what they do. They look at the loan, they look at the paperwork that's come in, they look at the AUS findings, they look at the application. Do the, first of all, does the documentation in the file match the AUS findings, and, does that, and do the numbers on there match what's on the application? That's really all that the initial underwrite is. Now, sometimes it's missing something. Sometimes the loan officer and the processor used too much income. So the underwriter will look at that and they'll do a calculation to say, wait a minute once, how did you arrive at this because I'm not coming up with the same numbers you are? If that happens, then they're going to ask a question. They're not going to deny the loan or anything. They're just going to probably ask the question. And from there, there's usually not, the whole file's not there yet because you're, it's at the very initial stage. So what happens, the underwriter then provides a series of conditions on that initial underwrite. The conditions are usually three different things, some related to title, some related to the borrower, and some related internally to the company, things that you have to do. That goes back to the processor who then has to start working on those documents. So those are the first two stages we talked about last week. Stage three. Stage three is a combination of, I want you to review these documents I have, and I want you to review the collateral. When I say collateral, I'm referring to the appraisal. Now, today, a little bit different than a few years ago, but today, a, you know, Appraisals are a big deal. Not that they weren't before, but they become a real big deal because you're putting contingencies on there. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from 
real estate agents every single weekend, or every single week for that matter, Greg, what should I put in for an appraisal contingency? Do I put in two days? Do I put in five days? Do I put in 14 days? Do I put in 21 days? What is it if it's a conventional loan? So today, when that appraisal comes in, we have to meet that contingency date if it's a conventional loan. And so today, as soon as that appraisal comes in, we move that appraisal, and I would like to think every lender does this, to meet that contingency date, it goes into underwriting. So that's part of your third piece of underwriting, AUS, then initial underwrite, and then collateral. And sometimes you attach other things to the collateral underwrite if you've got them in the file so that they can clear them and make sure they've got everything. But they're looking at that appraisal. They're, now, here, when you get an appraisal in and the lender calls you up and says, or a borrower sees the appraisal or somebody sees it and says, oh, we offered 300, that was our contract and it came in at 300. And everybody jumps for joy and everybody's happy. Now, Camille and I recently had a situation where a appraisal came in and we looked at the appraisal and the appraisal met value but we're looking at this, well, close to met value. But we looked at the appraisal, and the appraiser checked the box. On page two of the appraisal, there's a box that says, as is. The box next to it says, subject to. Subject to means there's repairs that have to be done before, before closing. On a conventional? On a, th yes. This one was marked as is. But... We already, Camille and I already knew there couldn't be as is. So I'm thinking, what did this appraiser do? And this didn't even go to underwriting yet. So what we did is I, I mean, how we knew it, we went and looked at the pictures and there was a, a mess of the deck. The deck was clearly in need of immediate repair. Otherwise it was gonna be a safety hazard. And so, I said to Brandy, I said, who's our processor? I said, Brandy, do me a favor. Get this into underwriting immediately. And the un it, was so, it was so good. The underwriter actually called me up and said, Greg, because I didn't put any notes in it. I just let the underwriter look at it. I said, Greg, did you see that deck? I said, of course we did. She said, I can't let this go as is. I says, I know you can't, but I wanted you to see it of course, we already know it. We're already working on getting that taken care of, but I want to make sure that we're going to be okay and how bad do you see it? She says, Greg, it's a safety hazard. That means no escrow holdback. That's a problem. We were hoping to get an escrow holdback, but we didn't because it's a safety, it was a serious safety hazard, which means something had to be done ahead of time. Yes. I'm going to hold on to that question, and I'll answer it in a moment for you, okay? The question was escrow holdback. What is it? I'll explain it in a moment. So underwriting now made a decision on that appraisal that said that we can't move forward until something else is done. Now, that's the purpose of an underwriter, is to look at the document, not just take it on the, on the, on the surface. And people think that, if the appraiser says it's this, then it is. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And the reason why, who has liability on that, on that loan? The lender. The lender, thank you. Not the appraiser. The appraiser might get their hand slapped. But if Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or HUD, or VA don't like an appraisal, well, not so much VA, because it all goes through their system, but Fannie Mae, USDA, and FHA, and Freddie Mac, if, if they don't like that appraisal, it comes back to the lender. You're exactly right. So the lender, the underwriter, has to sign off and say, I agree with the findings. And, and by the way, lenders, underwriters are not allowed to change value. They can't do that. What they're doing is saying the information provided on the comparables, the adjustments, everything that's there, they are in agreement with. If they're not in agreement, that's when they go back to the appraiser and say, hey, I don't like your adjustments on this, or I don't like some aspect 
of what you've done on this appraisal. You know, you said that this home was 20 years old and all the comps are five years old. You made no adjustment for age and you didn't put any comments in it. They might go back and say, just give me a reason why you didn't, didn't make any adjustments. It could be anything. Now, how often does that happen? Honestly, not very often, but it does. And when it does, it takes some creativity and some work to get it fixed, as Camille can vouch. So let me go back now to, first of all, any other questions on that before I go to escrow holdback? Rip. So I know with FHA and VA, but a conventional can come back and say, we're not doing this loan unless this is fixed? Absolutely, without question. So then what about like flips? Are those not typically conventional loans? Like a, an investment property that's obvious in need of work? Well, it depends on the nature of the work. Uh, this weekend, I was working on one. And it, there's, it's a two-bath place, a small place, but two-bath. One of the bathrooms is the, the flooring's got to be replaced, and they've got to put a new tub in. And they asked me about it. They're doing a conventional loan. They're going to put 20% down. They said, can we just let it go? I said, absolutely not. I said, that's a, that's a health and safety hazard. That will have to be fixed. You've got to have flooring in. You can't have just plywood. You've got to have flooring on a conventional loan. If there's broken windows, visible broken windows, that's going to have to be repaired before you can close. Makes absolutely no difference. Seller. What's that? It has to be by the seller. Does not have to be by the seller, but how many times do you find a buyer that's willing to pay to have work done before they own the home? Seldom. Now, sometimes, sometimes, Camille and I know, picking on Camille this morning, I'm so glad you're here, the Camille. So, it's quite the story. Yeah, it is quite the story. So, in any event, so, the, so it can be done by either party, but the work's going to have to be done. Now, let's go to escrow holdback. Escrow holdback says that there's work to be done on the house that the appraiser has said needs to be done. And it's not necessarily a health or safety hazard, but it's work that needs to be done on the house. Some, you know, whatever it happens to be, they might have to replace a couple shingles or um, they might have to repair the gutter or something of that nature. Um, and we'll see that a lot of times with fascia and gutters and um, a deck board or something that needs, it's not gonna hurt anything, but it's gotta be repaired. We'll see that. Whether it's conventional or FHA doesn't make any difference. And what a lender has the ability to do if they want is they can say, okay, how much is it going to cost to repair? And the repair costs come in at, let's just make it real simple, $3,000 to get this done. But you don't want to do it. The seller doesn't want to do it before. The buyer doesn't want to pay for it to get done before they close. So what you do is you hold back from the transaction, in this example, $3,000. And you actually don't hold back $3,000. The way escrow holdbacks work, you hold back one and a half percent. You hold back 150 percent. So if it's 3,000, lender's going to hold back $4,500. They're going to hold back $4,500. We're going to close the loan. The um, contract, or you've got to submit the contractor's bid. Everything's got to be turned in so you know what it's going to cost. Then the work gets done within one, two, three weeks. We call up the appraiser, send the appraiser go out to make sure the work's been done, and then we release the funds. That extra $150, that extra $1,500 in this case goes right back to whoever it's supposed to go to, buyer, seller, whatever the case is. So does that show up as a buyer debit or a seller debit? How depends on how, depends on who's paying for it. Okay. Is depends it on who's paying for it. What's that? Is it just for repairs or could you do the same for post-occupancy, for example? No, 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 just repairs. And it has to show up on the appraisal. If the appraiser does not make note of anything, we can't do an escrow holdback. It has to be something the appraiser identifies. Now, I will say, we have actually put notes to our appraisers once in a while. Would you please check this out? And then hopefully they check it out and make a note of it. And we know it's a minor issue, but we know it's going to be taken care of after closing. We do a small escrow holdback. Escrow holdbacks do have limits. In our case of our company, the limit is $5,000, which means we're going to hold back $7,500. Anything over that, 
requires underwriting management decision to go above it. I've actually done one where we held back as much as $18,000. Um, but again, that's, you got to get proof of that. But escrow holdbacks are good tools. Does that answer the question? Okay. Again, appraiser has to say it. So that's your third underwrite, is your collateral. Now, in the case of FHA, um, you know, the collateral underwrite or USDA, the co as you know, there's an amendatory clause. It does not have a number of days you got to have the appraisal in. It simply says... On the amendatory clause, if that home does not appraise for the contract sales price, the buyer does not have to buy the house, period. There's no time limit. There's no days on it. Not like a conventional loan where you put in the number of days for your financing contingency. But whether it's FHA or, it's, um, or not, or conventional, as far as I'm concerned, I want to get that loan in I want to get that appraisal in to underwriting so that they can review it because I don't want to have anything pop up at the last minute. Just knowing that somebody's got to put their eyeballs on it and I don't want to wait till the last day. Okay, makes sense so far? That's your third underwrite. Fourth underwrite. And sometimes you don't even have a fourth one. Sometimes you do the fourth one with number three. But the fourth underwrite is what we call the most famous and magical three words in our business. Anybody know what they are? Clear to close. Clear to close. That's right. We submit the loan for clear to close. And when you send it in for clear to close, if the processor, the loan officer, the appraiser, if everybody has done their job properly, and you've identified you've got everything done the way it's supposed to be done, then it goes back to the underwriter. The underwriter checks down their whole list of things that had to be done, and they send us back those magical three words, clear to close. Now, every once in a while, a loan will come back. When we submitted it for clear to close, and it comes back without the clear to close. Gosh, that is one of the most frustrating things you can have. It's frustrating to you, it's frustrating to me, it's frustrating to the borrower, it's frustrating to the processor. And generally speaking, it's not the underwriter's fault. The underwriter is just saying, look, I'm liable for this. I'm signing that this is all good. But this document that was sent in doesn't match what I asked you for. And that can oftentimes be a verification of employment. It can oftentimes be verbiage that had to come in from the appraiser. It could be something on the contract that wasn't in yet. Did you ever get a call from a lender, me maybe, that, you know, we're like three or four days before closing and I'm saying, hey, wait a minute once, I've got amendment, uh, I got amendment two here, but I don't have an amendment one. What's amendment one look like? And all of a sudden, you, oh, I've got it here. You send, me, you send me amendment one. And I, if I'm smart, I look at amendment one to make sure it says what it what needs to say. Because God forbid I send an amendment one to the processor who doesn't look at it because she's busy. Sends it in underwriting. Underwriting's never too busy to look at every word in that document. Finds something wrong the way it was written and comes back to us and says, not only did I not give you clear to close before, but I'm not giving you clear again because blah, 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 blah. And everybody wants to point to the underwriter and says, the underwriter made a mistake. No, underwriter didn't make a mistake. Loan officer did, processor did. Let's make sure we get our stuff done right. So the underwriter's responsibility is actually to protect the lender and protect the borrower. That's what their job is, is to make sure they can, they can make these payments, to make sure that they've got everything that the borrower said they could do, they can do. They're making this kind of money. All of those things fit in place, and that the lender is actually going to be protected. Their people should not have a default. Does that make sense? So those are the four stages of underwriting. AUS, initial underwrite, collateral, and clear to close. Now, how long does all of that take? Well, I would say if you were talking September of 2020, if you were doing a purchase, you could, at least where I was working at that time, not there today, but at that time, if you were a purchase and you just went through the normal system and you went in for your initial underwrite, it was terrible. 
Your initial underwrite would be probably about, uh, about seven to 10 days. If you were a refinance, you were easily 45 days just sitting there. It would just go into queue and it would just sit there. Why? Because back then, we were doing so many loans, it was stupid. I mean, September, you know, June, July, August, September, October, November of 2020 was insanity. And there, were, there was not enough, as we used to say, you've got a hose that is this big and you're trying to get, you're trying to put this into a funnel that's this big. Well, guess where all the water goes? Outside the funnel. That's what's happening. That's what happened back then. Now, for example, at least in our, in our case, um, initial underwrites are taking 24 to 48 hours. This week's probably going to be 48, maybe even 72, because they're having, I was telling Lanier, they're having an awards trip and that I didn't go on, and I was invited. Um, but anyway, so some of the people are over there for that awards trip out in Mexico. So it might be an extra day, but not a big deal. Most of the time today, 24, 48 hours, you get your underwriting, initial underwrite done. Collateral underwrite, much the same. Clear to close, most people put that as a very, very high priority. One of the first things underwriters will do each day. Therefore, usually 24 hours if you get it submitted by like 3.30 or 4 o'clock the day before, you'll get your clear to close. Now that can change, that varies from lender to lender depending on how they've got all their stuff set up and how much capacity they have. So right now, a lot of lenders are looking for more business, so they're, they've got capacity. All right, any questions? Okay, next week, we are gonna dive into um, appraisals, and I'm gonna talk again, which you've heard me talk about before, but I'm gonna talk about the things that go into an appraisal that can screw it up, whether it's conventional, whether it's the um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac scoring system, which some of you've heard me talk about before, the scores one, two, five on uh, UCPD, we're going to make sure we go through that so you can understand enough about an appraisal that it's not just getting value. There's a little bit more to it than that. And with pricing going up like this, appraisals don't always keep up. They're maybe, but they're not always keeping up. So that's what we're going to cover next week. All right? Thanks.